perfect shot, man. This truly is a trophy. Not because of what it is, but for what we had to accomplish to get it. Pain training. I love it. See how your heart rate is right now? This is what Elkin is like. Now you gotta make a shot. Welcome to the Geared for the Outdoors podcast, brought to you by NUMA Outdoors. I'm your host and NUMA team member, Will Cooper. The Geared for the Outdoors podcast is dedicated to bow hunters and all those who love the outdoors. Our mission here is to bring you information from industry experts and veteran hunters that can help better prepare you for your next hunt. We understand that our time in the outdoors is precious, and that's why NUMA's mission is to bring you gear that is built to over-deliver, designed to outperform, and proven to outlast. To learn more, head to our website at numaoutdoors.com, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We appreciate y'all listening in, and we hope y'all enjoy. What's up, everybody? It's Will coming back for another episode of the Geared for the Outdoors podcast. Thanksgiving is upon us, so from the NUMA family to yours, we want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving and a happy and safe holidays ahead. Hopefully, instead of sitting in the office or in traffic right now headed to the office, hopefully you're either on the way to the blind or you're up in a tree stand or in a blind somewhere trying to chase and put a big buck down on the ground. But nevertheless, we're bringing on NUMA Recon team member Jeff Moran today. He's had some pretty cool stuff that he's done in the industry from full draw film tour, putting giant elk on the ground, doing some solo hunting. But we're bringing Jeff on board today to talk to us, get to know him a little bit more for you guys. Y'all can get to know him. But we just want to thank all y'all for tuning in, and we hope you enjoy. Well, man, Jeff, we just want to thank you for hopping on with us today, taking the time. I know talking briefly you said like for two weeks it's kind of been crazy for you but let's give the listeners just a quick thirty thousand foot view of who jeff moran is oh who i am where to start um man i so i am well actually i live there now so i'm originally from the boise idaho area uh grew up in idaho and really that was the only place like from a hunting perspective, that was all I did. Um, for about 15 years or 14 years, I left and I was all over the country. And But every single year I, I managed to fly back and um, and at least get on an elk hunt and, and get all that stuff taken care of. But it's, uh, I, I guess as far as like, I don't know, that's a tough question. So if we're going to go from... <clears throat> Like I got my start in the hunting industry, like a lot of us did, which was following my dad around when I was a kid, and uh, yeah, it it was a little bit different back then. So we they were primarily like road hunters. Like we would glass from the road, grass from the truck, and and if we saw something, we might go after it. But that was that was the extent of it. Uh, we never got out and hiked. We never got out and walked. Um, and then I will I want to say it was almost exactly ten years ago that. I I was living in Canada at the time and I came back from Canada and I went on a like my first like backcountry hunt, so to speak, with a buddy of mine. We 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 took a quad off of some some small trail for like four miles and then we hiked several miles back in there and lived out of a backpack for five or six days and I was kind of hooked after that because it, it was a different experience. Like I got far enough back in there that like a deer would like look at you and and like kind of like walk up to you curious like a horse would because <laughs> they didn't they'd never seen you before yeah um and i'm not used to that because i was i mean where i had always hunted I man the, the first sight of a person they're like they're like a mile over the next ridge and uh <clears throat> so I, th- that was like my first experience into it my buddy shot a deer i told him not to and it was pretty rough my body was beat up um i had just gone from like sea level to I don't know. We were like 9,000 feet and I was struggling. Uh, but I, yeah, I, I learned to love it really quickly. And I, I that's kind of where the whole backcountry thing started for me. And, and that's primarily what I do now is I try and get as far away from, from the average everyday hunter as possible. And I, I live back there most of the time I'm by myself. So, uh, you want to call it a solo hunter or some crazy dude that, that disappears in the wilderness, whatever you want. But, um, 
I, I switched over to archery and that's primarily what I do now, even though I just shot a couple of animals with, with a rifle and, yeah. and, uh, it's it's taken on a life of its own when when you anybody who follows my social media or anything like that it's become i i get a lot of requests for people that want me to do anywhere from like a seminar to help like answer a million questions like i've been trying to help a buddy right now in eastern idaho uh track down some elk just by maps and i finally got him on some after like four days but it's it's I don't know. It, it it's kind of different and unique for me because it, it's not how I grew up hunting. Uh, that's where the love of it came from. But uh, I slowly ventured off into this like wanting to be able to learn and survive in the wilderness, which I guess nowadays is not really a bad skill at all. No, no, heck, not <laughs> with the way thing, with the way things are going nowadays. You never know, man. You might have to get on what, what's his name, Tim Kennedy's side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's yeah it's getting a little interesting out there so the idea that i know how to do all that stuff and and learned how to to fish with like a just like a hand line and and uh everything from the horses to to shoot you name it yeah. um i can pretty much go back there and survive actually last year my my wyoming hunt i was back there for about a little over three weeks by myself so that was um I think that's probably the extent that I've done in one trip. Yeah. But it, it's still kind of unique to be able to go back and, and that's what you get to do. And that's how you get to hunt. And, oh, heck and yeah, so man. So. When did you, when did you first harvest or when did you get your first elk with a bow? How old were you? <clears throat> well, 10 years ago. So 25, 25, okay. 20, 25, 26. Okay. Um, yeah. Cause well, I didn't get one that year. I got one the next year. And it it was kind of one of those really weird experiences. Like I went in there, I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know how to call. I couldn't bugle, no clue. Um, we got in there and found a herd of elk. There was a herd bull and I was just young, dumb and naive and figured I could get on him and I couldn't, but I started cow calling like right, right close to dark. And we had a bunch of bulls run in on top of us, like right. satellites. And for me, I mean, that happened in 48 hours. Like I went, I was hunting for my first time with a bow and and was driving home with a bull in the back of the truck 48 hours later. Uh, Heck yeah. <laughs> that should never happen. But Can't complain it, uh, about that, though. <laughs> no, you can't. It's never happened again. But uh, it, <clears throat> that, was, that was the first time I had harvested a, a bull. So nobody in my family has actually ever shot a bull. And, and that was kind of one of my goals going into it. And I was kind of criticized for it. Um, by friends and family just to kind of venture off into something that nobody was really did or was good at. And then of course you become addicted to it at that point. Uh, the screaming bulls and, and September evenings and all that sort of stuff. And that's, that's what you kind of come to live for. Um, <clears throat> I have ventured off into these like late November archery hunts, which have been a whole different world yeah. uh, in the last couple of years. Cause that that's a lot of eyes and that relies on, just being stealthy, playing the wind, playing the waiting game, testing your patience probably more than I'm capable of most times. But uh, yeah, so that's that's the elk kind of side of it. Well, man, I I think I'm probably kind of in that same boat with you. It's like nobody in my family has shot one yet, and I started elk hunting about two years ago, and I'm hopelessly addicted now. And it's like I white, grew up whitetail hunting here in Central Texas, but now it's like okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's still fun, but getting up there in the mountains, like I spent two weeks up there with Cody and Justin from from our team, and dude, we got into a herd of them. We had a herd bull that was like 350, 360 is what we were guessing. Giant, bugling his head off. It was a freaking awesome experience, but just had too many cows with them. We couldn't pull them away. Couldn't get it done. Usually, when I get into those situations, if, I, if they're close enough, like I put the calls down and I start crawling. See, uh, the problem was we it. actually had like a little draw with a meadow that we had just a little bit too much open space between us. Uh, it's it, it becomes a, a pain at that point, especially because I mean that's what I dealt with this year um, in September because I went very late and I was dealing with herd bulls that had ten, twelve cows, and man, you're not gonna the 
a lot of people I, I've heard a lot of people say like get within 100 yards and like challenge them and every time I've done that that late in the season they pick up and leave do they really um, yeah it's it's happened every single time the only time I've had any luck was uh going in and I, I start just chuckling and, and calling out his cows because then he gets upset about it if I just ignore him um <clears throat> instead of arguing back and forth because they they usually bounce they don't yeah. fight but <sighs> It's it is it is like you said it's a, or we both said it's addicting at that point and and <clears throat> and becomes something that you look forward to and can't wait to get out every single year and and once you harvest one I, have you shot one yet? Not yet, man. It's it's gonna happen soon. I hope. Man, they are they are some big animals. Like you walk up to them and you're just you, you know they're big, and then when you you're standing over one, you're just like, what in the world? Like, how am I going to get this out? And, and, and it, it's, it's so, you haven't experienced the pain. I mean, it's painful just to run around those mountains like that. But oh, yeah. The, the, the pain of having to carry a big core on your back for five, six miles, that's a whole new world. Yeah, that, that's a different, that's a different, <laughs> different experience right there. It, you get into these, you get to these positions and you'll, you'll experience it sometime, but you'll get about halfway back and you're like, this is stupid. Like, what am I doing? I'm never doing this again. Like, this is awful. This is horrid. And, and, uh, but you can't go backwards. You can't just give up. You can't do anything. So like, you just have to gut it out and yeah. grin and bear it. And then once you actually make it back, it's like, I don't know, the accomplishment or the sense of accomplishment is, is more than, than you're ready for at that point. But it's, yeah, about halfway in that middle part, you're going to question your life and question about everything about it at that point. <laughs> All the demons want to come gonna, out. <laughs> everything. everything. You get mad. Like, I've got stuck in rainstorms during that time. I got stuck in an ice storm. I had to fall asleep on the side of the mountain one time because I was too dehydrated trying to pack it out. It was, yeah. Damn. Good times. <laughs> Shoot. I've had some sketchy ones. I bet. Man, so tell me, tell us a little bit about what what you do kind of for your everyday job besides going and spending most of the fall up in the mountains with your horses. Like tell us what you do for everyday life. Um, so everyday life, I actually run and own a, like an online, uh, we do like nutritional supplements, training, fitness, nutrition plans, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's slowly building out. Um, in it's it's called Bill Athletics, or if you go to BillAthletics.com, you kind of track it down. And, and yeah, we we kind of cater towards uh, a lot of the companies that um, instead of just being fitness and nutrition oriented, I try and cater towards companies that are uh, that will support the industry, whether it be the Second Amendment, whether it be military veterans, first responders, hunters, mm -hmm. fishing, the outdoors, those sort of things. Because a lot of people don't realize that. Half the companies you buy stuff from, they don't actually support you, uh, yeah. especially in our in our industry. And, and it's getting bigger, unfortunately. And, and there's even some companies inside our industry now that are kicking money the wrong direction. But we're not going to talk about that. Um, <laughs> the uh, and so trying to, to to vet the right people and vet everything and and make sure that we're dealing with the right companies. And that's kind of taken some time to build up and. And so my my everyday job is actually pretty boring. Um, I'm kind of sitting in front of a desk a lot, and I'm updating like code work on websites and and talking to people on conference calls and and doing advertising work and, and coming up with like promotions and having meetings with a couple employees, this sort of thing. So, <clears throat> I mean, it's everybody looks at these adventures I take and and say they wish they could do this and that or and i'm like man i sit behind a desk like 60 hours a week but yeah i guess um <laughs> now that said i do have the horses and there's a lot of work to be done with the horses so i do get out most days and throw a saddle on and uh, i think i went out riding for a couple hours last night uh at one of the parks close by and how how and, did you get into horse like did you do rodeo growing up or did you just decided so, to get into owning a horse one day no so growing up my like my grand my grandfather and uh like my 
great uncle, I guess, and, and some of them, they all had horses and farms. Um, the one side of my family is very heavy into like the farming industry. Yeah. Okay. And so, so I grew up a little bit around horses. Yeah. Um, I was around the rodeo and stuff like that as a kid. Uh, and I kind of got away from it altogether, but I, I mean, I always loved horses. I always loved dealing with them. And, you know, so I was involved, uh, well, for the, the time that I left Idaho, I was, I was door to door sales. So I'm basically like the scum of the earth. Like nobody wants a door to door salesman ever knocking on your door, but that's what <laughs> I did. <laughs> I think everybody needs to do that at least once in their life. They do actually. I would, I, highly recommend it to everybody because the the misery that you go through and the amount of rejection and everything that you go through is is something that that's important because it teaches you to kind of let things go um, yeah but it also but also it teaches you to hold a conversation with somebody yeah. um that, that one of the like downsides to a lot of people that go right out of college or whatever and go right into work is they can't talk to anybody about anything because all they know is maybe what they experienced in their life and and th- what their job description was in college they're mm-hmm. not very well versed so like they can I've recite had, their resume to you yep that's about it and so finding somebody who can just talk about anything is is um that's difficult nowadays uh <clears throat> so yeah when I was doing that, I, I never had any intentions of coming back to Idaho. And then, um, I had, well, basically my girlfriend, fiance or whatever, her and I have a long time, we had broken up and I was kind of, I was stuck under some contracts in, in Louisville, Kentucky. And I had this company that I was, that I was working on building. And to me, the, the best place to go probably would have been back to Idaho. Uh, most of you don't realize, so Idaho is where bodybuilding.com originated. And there's a, a huge like fitness following here, but there's also a huge hunting industry uh, really? following. Yeah. So <clears throat> this is one of the fastest growing areas for like the hunting industry period. Most of the pack companies, the big like heavy duty backcountry pack companies, Initial Ascent, uh, XO, um then there's a couple other ones they're all out of the boise area um you have a bunch of different broadheads you have arrows you have uh, i mean there's tent companies uh, a lot of stuff is actually out of idaho and it made sense to me if i was going to be working from a fitness perspective with people that want to go do those types of hunts yeah uh to come back and not necessarily well i wanted to come back out west i didn't necessarily want to come back to, to boise um, it's not my favorite place to live, but everybody else seems to love it. It's just kind of one of those things where I grew up here and would rather be somewhere else. <laughs> kind of like, yeah, hey, it'll do all right. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. So anyways, I came back and, you know, I had, I guess we could talk about that a little bit. I was, I was heavily involved with, um, sponsorships and stuff like that mm-hmm. in the hunting industry. I had a fairly big social media following. I had just had a film that went into the full draw film tour. Um, they were talking about companies were talking about sending camera guys with me and doing like commercials and promotions. And, and, you know, I really decided that that wasn't what I wanted. And I was really struggling with hunting personally because like I enjoyed it and I loved it. And it, it was always something that I did. Well, I was primarily a solo hunter, but there's a lot of pressure and everything behind it. And I, I, I just wasn't enjoying it as much as I used to. And it wasn't necessarily my favorite thing anymore. And <clears throat> so I decided to go on a hunt in which, you know, I, I grew up around the horses and, and everybody's, there's a lot of people who would tell you their like dream is, is a horseback elk hunt. Yeah. And I mean, it, it's got to be a huge percentage of the industry with and the wall tent, like, the wood stove and everything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, give or take. I, I've never hunted that way with a wall tent. I wish, but yeah, um, I was just like, you know what? I've been around horses. I'm just going to wing it. And I, I found a place actually that you can rent horses. And I knew that I didn't want to tie horses together. So I rented two of them, uh, draft horses, which are bigger than your average everyday quarter horses sits out in the pasture. And, okay. and um, I disappeared back into the middle of Wyoming and <clears throat> that was a, a, an entirely different experience i think i saw like four people in in three weeks and that was in which is kind of not 
common. Um, and <clears throat> it, it was an adventure because I hadn't really been around the horses in a long time. But I, once I got out there, it, it made me fall in love like with hunting and what I was doing all over again. Like, yeah, there were some difficult times with the horses and we had some arguments like that's just going to happen. But, yeah. um, <clears throat> it, the, it was a lot more peaceful to me. And like, I don't know, probably one of my favorite things is riding the horse back to camp, like in the middle of the night, because you don't turn your headlamp on or anything. You just kind of let the reins go and let the horse go where he wants. He knows where he's going. Oh, yeah. And, and you're sitting there in the, the moonlight in the dark and on the ridge top and just you let him take you back four or five miles and it's it's uh it's a unique experience and and so when i came out of there i knew that i wanted to make that my regular hunt like i wasn't just going to drive up and and be able to hike out of camp anymore i wanted to disappear um be able to live on my own and like off grid as far as i could whether it be finding a, a lake somewhere that i could fish in for food or shooting grouse or something during the midday and <clears throat> so it's kind of taken on a whole new life of its own and it's kind of i guess uh evolved several times over the years into what it is now but <clears throat> that that was it that's the only reason i have horses now i have huge pack horses like uh bugs he's my new pack horse he uh came from a competition cart team he's a percher on that stands 18.2 hands tall and if Jeez. that makes sense to, if it sense to anybody the top of his back is six foot two um he weighs about 2200 pounds <laughs> and I, I could probably throw a full bull on top of his back and like not quarters just a full bull and he would be fine no um, kidding yeah it's it's <laughs> to me, that's fun. I like dealing with the big horses just because I don't have to tie them together. It's I, I've seen horse like strings blow up, yeah, and it's been ugly. But it, it, they, I mean, with the just like everything else with inflation, they they kind of cost even more right now because hay's going through the roof. <laughs> everything is right now. It's insane. <sighs> Yeah, it's a little bit rough and the whole supply. I mean, everybody talks about supply chain and hay is everything that we get here, but the drought was pretty rough. And, and, uh, I mean, I guess some areas of the country didn't experience it, but it was man, antler growth and everything here was, was down. We see a lot of busted bulls already. Um, it's all just because of lack of nutrition. So, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's where the horses came from. I, I, I moved back and I, wasn't loving hunting anymore because of everything that I was surrounded by. And so I decided to, to change it up and took a risk on that one. I mean, but, but it's really not that hard. And, and I've, I've been meaning to write an article about how I did it, like finding a place to get horses from taking them up, like what my experiences were, what my like trial and error situations were, where I messed up, those sort of things. Cause, cause I think there's a lot of people out there that want to go do it but they have no idea and they most people don't even know that you can like rent horses like that and which is a little sketchy but <laughs> well i think right. if you if you kind of grew up around them you'd probably be all right but i i love i want i want to go back to what you said a minute a minute ago about you know just getting out there uh essentially letting the horse just you know let the reins fall out of your hands and just let him guide you but I love with what you do, taking the horses and just getting back there and away from people because there's nothing that beats. I mean, I've only been on three elk hunts now, but there's nothing that beats getting out there, not being around people. You're not hearing traffic. You don't have service on your phone. So your phone's not going off for crap from work. It's you're just yeah. out there under the stars and it's freaking awesome, man it is it, there and a lot of time if you can find the right places there's a lot more animals too and it's and i hate to talk about it a little bit because part of me is like don't don't tell people about these things because they'll start doing it <laughs> um but at the same time i mean you get far enough back there and you you're you're on your own and that's kind of a 
a new position that you're putting. I mean, you're always kind of on your own in life and making sure that you're going to work and you're making money and you're, you're getting a job done. But out there, it's a whole different world. It's, uh, it's almost like survival and yeah. survival of the fittest, I guess. And, and well, I mean, you're stepping into their domain the, <sighs> the minute you get off that, that trail or off the, tra- and, well, off the trailhead. Yeah. And, and a lot of people will only go like three or four miles, but I think my, the, the bull I shot in Wyoming was like 12, 13 miles back. And this year I went to a place that was like seven or eight miles, but it was over really rough, rugged terrain. And when I got back there, it was like every, probably every hundred yards I was running into either mountain lion tracks or bear tracks. And that was so, so I mean, there's a lot more predators once you get back there as well. And it's, it's, uh, sometimes your strategy has to change and you have to kind of play it by ear. Um, yeah but sure. but it's but the quality of animal a lot of times is different too like the deer hunt that we just went on um i shot a, a small little three point i didn't think anything much of him i was mostly interested in getting back and, and going on my cow hunt and uh you know when i we took the horses back to a section that the trails and everything are are closed except for foot traffic and horseback yeah and, and the other side of the mountain the trails like you can take um dirt bikes or or uh e-bikes or whatever up the set that side and when we got back like my my little three point was bigger than the four points that everybody at the main trailhead had shot no kidding and we didn't see anything like we didn't see a single person back there and all the deer like the, the deer that i shot he was probably one of the smallest that we saw in, in, a, in a few days Dang. and for him to come out heavier and bigger than the three that in the four points and, and some of the deer that these guys were all bragging about was, I mean, it just shows you the quality of animal once you can get back there. Um, yeah. and, and we weren't really that far away. Uh, it was, I don't know, maybe 10 miles, like around the mountain. If you were to go right over the top, it was maybe four or five. But okay. it's but the fact that you get back there, you don't see anybody. We saw the amount of animals that we saw. Like I don't know. I think in one day we probably saw like twenty five or thirty bucks. Oh heck, um, you can't beat that at all. No, and you're just sitting there trying to pick and choose which one you want to go after, and and um, as long as you're glassing and you know what you're doing, and <laughs> you're willing to sit there and be patient, it it, it makes a huge difference. And and being it's and it's just peaceful um even during rifle season like you barely hear any shots and you're like okay this is this is nice yeah Um, that's when you know you're in the right spot (laughs) yeah well sometimes (laughs) yeah yeah i've been back there where just you you don't run into anything you're like man what what's going on you sit there and analyze everything and (laughs) then you have to talk to biologists and figure out what the whole like vegetation issue is and all sorts of stuff but that's that's going into a much larger topic. Heck, that's a whole nother podcast series in itself. <laughs> Probably. Let's talk about, now you've done a full draw film tour. You've submitted a film. Let's, I want to talk about that. Now where you got a freaking big bull. Let's talk about that guy. Where'd you, where'd you get him at? So I grew up hunting in this place and I was going to post a little video about it at one point, but so I grew up hunting in this place that, that we used to drive over to when I was a kid when we, because we always get like deer tags and cow tags. And we would mostly drive over to this area to look at the mountain goats when I was a kid. And my dad and uncle and stuff, they would, they were like, no, we're never going to hunt here again. It's too hard. And, and, um, uh, it was something that we did every year. We would drive over there, and, but come to find out, like my uncle, he had spent some time over there hunting when he was a kid. Yeah, and he was chasing deer and everything. There was a big fire, I believe, the year I was born. There was a huge fire in there, and it kind of wiped out a lot of the stuff. And and it's it's grown since then. Um, and I'd I'd gone back. I started going back. Actually, that was where I first shot an elk. Um, and I started going in there, and I started to understand the different patterns that, that elk had done. And, and I had never shot, like, I remember one guy on social media was giving me a hard time one time because I had so many followers, but I'd only shot a bunch of five points and 
I was like a five point king is what I called myself back then. <laughs> and it was every single year I'd walk out with a five point and, um, which was a great accomplishment to me, but at the same time I yeah. was like dr- dreamed of a herd bull and we went in there, we went back in there and I, I, actually the very first day i have it on camera where i'm there's a bull bugling underneath me and i I told the cameraman that i'm not going after him he's not big enough um i didn't see him i just could hear him and he wasn't what i wanted and lo and behold it was the bull that ended up shooting which was a big six by seven on public land with i think he scored a 330 and seven eights or 331 which i mean That's on a, a public dang land bull. Yeah, on public land over the counter, that's that's a great bull. Um, and well, if, as long as you're not in a state like Arizona or something, yeah, that's just a different that's a different breed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, anyways, <clears throat> we we hunted for like six or seven days, and then I came across him, and and he had it was just him and probably like twenty cows, and it I I blew two other like attempts to stock up and get a shot on him. And it's different with a cameraman too. Like you're trying to make sure I had hunted by myself for so long that I didn't really understand. Like, I don't know. I almost felt responsible to like take care of the guy at the time. He he was from, he was from the Midwest. It was his first trip into anything that was like super gnarly like that from a terrain standpoint. And, uh, you know, I, I finally got lucky. He presented me with a shot about, I think we had two days left and he, he gave me a shot, which most people don't like. Like it was, it was a frontal shot. Um, and it was at a distance. It was a little over 50 yards. And most, most people won't take it, but if you feel really confident in what you're shooting and you practice right and you know pretty much everything about the angles and everything that you're going to shoot at. Um, I don't know. I, I felt confident and the cameraman was zoomed in on him. I hit him right down his throat. Blood went everywhere and. It was it was kind of a unique experience for me. Um, now what to have, the, especially the cameraman right behind my shoulder. That was fun. Oh heck yeah! What was the name of the film for that y'all submitted to Full Draw? <laughs> uh, I believe it was called To Hell and Back. It's still up on the Full Draw Film Tour um, YouTube channel because, of course, I would get the one year that all of the stuff would happen, and then COVID hit. <laughs> Gosh. And so full. Full draw couldn't go out to the movie theaters. So they actually did an online event and I told them they could just keep, I didn't have a YouTube. Um, so I told them they could just keep up the, the film. So I believe it's still there. It's episode three, I, I think, yep. um, from 20, from 2020. And it, the only problem is we never, we never actually produced, um, the, a full length film to talk about a lot of the stuff that I had gone through prior to the hunt. Cause to me, I, I went through a lot of personal things um, mm-hmm. pr- prior to the hunt, and I really didn't think I was going to be able to go on that. And I, I kind of got lucky, like everything, all the cards like fell in the right place for me to even go. And I, I, I didn't know if I was going to be able to go like less than 24 hours before I had to leave. And it, I kind of just lucked out, and I got, I was able to get over there, and I was able to get in on a herd bull and, and take my biggest bull. Um, and he was in a, a really brutal place and we got stranded on the side of the mountain trying to pack him out in the dark. Like we, we had, didn't have any water. We got Damn. dehydrated. We had, we had to sleep on the side of the mountain, try and get up the next morning and get out. And then the next evening, trying to get the rest of the mountain, we got hit with an ice storm. And you're, it was one of those things where like you, you're getting rained on, but it was so cold. Your clothes were frozen and. So I was, we had to try and pack in like an extra, like, uh, change of clothes. And so I think we ended up getting back the second night at like one in the morning, God. like fro- frozen solid. And the night before we stayed out on the mountain, it was just underneath a tarp. It was, it was good time. It was a good experience for him because I've done it several times, but the cameraman, he had never experienced anything like that. Like it's, he, he was probably hating you for a good while. Oh, well, probably, probably still does. That's okay. Um, because I actually, most people think I'm crazy, but my average day pack probably weighs close to 45 pounds because I, I take about three days worth of food with me and I take a tarp in case I have to sleep, in case I decide to sleep out there. Um, a lot of people will hunt from like their spike camp or from their like base camp. They'll walk 
two, three, four miles, or they'll walk all day, they'll chase the animals, and they're like, oh, shoot, it's dark. And so now they got to walk all the way back to camp. And, you know, if it's far enough, I'll actually just sleep out under a tarp. I don't care how cold it is. Um, you could start a fire, we can figure it out. But, oh, heck yeah. Uh, <laughs> because I'd rather not like waste the energy cl- coming out and going back in. And I mean, it does make for a, a heavier pack during the day, but it, I've had success that way. And so that's kind of just the way that I have to continue that. So, no. um, as, as far as like submitting the film, that was, that's a whole different world because i mean then you have to take all the clips and sit there and narrow everything down to like 12 minutes and try and make everything flow yeah and probably the the hardest part about it honestly is probably finding music (laughs) yeah without getting the copyright stuff well even that but trying to find the right sound and trying to find the right like uh I guess like theme that you're going for with the film, whether it be dramatic or slow or high action or I don't know. And it's, it, t- it takes a couple of days of sitting there listening to music just to come up with something for a 12 minute film. Like to me, it did. Oh, yeah. I don't know about the average person, but yeah. Uh, so why did y'all name it to Helen back? A <laughs> um, couple reasons. Uh, there was, so the, the area that I was hunting in at the time, um, yeah, I'll give it up. I don't really care. It's, it's, uh, Hell's Canyon, Idaho. Okay. Was where I was at. Yeah. So, and it, it's coming off of, and most people don't realize this. So before anybody just like runs and jumps online and want to go in there, um, Hell's Canyon is the biggest canyon in North America. It's the deepest. It, it tops the Grand Canyon. Yeah. It's not, it's not for the faint of heart. If you're going to dive down in there, you got to understand that like on your average everyday like life, you're going from the top at 7,000 feet and you're dropping, you're going to drop two to 4,000 feet just to get into the animals. And then you got to climb back out every day. And it's, it's straight up and down. We're not talking about like (laughs) gradual decline here. Um, and I've ran, I've ran into people yearly that go up in there and they walk around and, and they'll walk the trails and they've asked me, is there some place like less steep to hunt? And they've asked me, a lot of guys won't get off the trail. And so unless you're prepared for something like that, then, then that's it. But also from my, my like personal life, I went through, like I said, I, I had gone through some things in my, my life that I wasn't prepared for. Um, and actually, not too long uh prior to that hunt i had actually spent some time homeless and Dang. trying to fend for myself and and get by and um i didn't really know where my life was headed for a while and uh which was crazy because maybe a year earlier like i thought everything was like i was living the the dream life and everything was going to be amazing and so I went through some of that stuff and, and I was climbing, basically climbing back out of like the hell that I was in, in my, my personal life in those situations prior to that hunt. Um, and, and I had gotten back to a, a fairly like decent place in my life when yeah. the hunt happened. So that was good. But it, uh, you know, there, to me, there was just a lot. And that was my first hunt since all of that stuff had taken place. And so it kind of meant more to me than the everyday hunt. Um, I, I mean, every hunt is is special in its own way, but that one was kind of different. Yeah, um, it had more. <laughs> just meant more. Yeah, yeah it, it did. And, and then going back, probably between that one and my first like horseback hunt were were the two that they kind of changed a lot of things about hunting for me. But <laughs> um, gave you a new perspective. It did, and and appreciation for what it does and my butt so i have a buddy named sam weatherman he's a guy uh in wyoming and up in missouri and he he posted a story a couple years ago and he reposted every year um about how he had this guy come to his his outfitter service and he wanted to shoot a buck he was an older gentleman and the guy the guy like started crying and everything at the end because he he had told sam before he took the shot that you know this was this is probably going to be my last time. This is going to be the last time. And Sam said he cried like a little baby during the hunt, like packing this guy's deer out. And, you know, when you think about it, 
you never know, especially when the way my life was headed, you never know when it's going to be like your last time or your last like hurrah on the mountain or anything. And, no. you know, we hope, we hope to all live it out until the end, but you, you don't know. And, and I, I think, I became, I had gotten to a point where I was a lot more humble about it at that point. And yeah. when I, when I was able to go on that hunt and I, you don't, I, there was a time where I thought you needed all the fanciest and biggest and brightest things. And now half of my like backcountry gear comes from like Walmart, <laughs> but it, uh, at the same time, like there are some things that I don't go cheap on. Yeah. Um, camo and packs, for example, but 100%. <laughs> The, those things are, are critical to me, but um, I don't know. I, all this stuff happened. It was just a new, like, found appreciation for for life and and um, the hunting that I that I am able to go do, and the fact that I'm not going to be able to do this forever. And so I yeah. have to appreciate where I'm at, and what I'm doing, and all of that sort of stuff. I love that you brought that story up about that older gentleman going on what he pretty much believed to be his last hunt, because I think that's something that we all need to think about when we're out there on the mountain or you're up in a tree, doesn't matter where you are, or what you're hunting, but I've seen it too many times that guys get upset because they didn't kill and it's the end of the world, you know, the hunts ruined or, you know, animals, elk aren't talking, animals aren't there. And, I've just seen too many guys just get in the piss poor attitude. They just get pissy and it honestly just kind of ruins the hunt, not only for them, but the people that are with them Yeah, when they don't, well, when they don't realize it, Hey, this dude, this might be your last hunt. You never know. And, and that's absolutely. Um, I can tell you that how I started to be like a solo hunter or whatever is, is um, I had a buddy and his uncle or friend or whatever was with us. And we were in there for like a 10 day hunt. And the, I want to say the second day it rained a ton. And yeah. the third day, the third day, like he slipped and fell a couple times and he got really angry and he just screw this. I'm going home, whatever. And we got back to camp that night and he did. He packed up and they left. Damn. And I, I stayed on the mountain for like another six or seven days by myself. And that's when I learned to, I, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to depend on anybody else anymore because. <clears throat> who knows what's going to happen. And, and a lot of people, they do, they get upset about that or they get upset about, <clears throat> or they, they might, <clears throat> they might be pushing for something big and, and it doesn't happen. They get upset or, or, uh, you know, and you have to, it's just a new appreciation for pretty much everything. And if, if it's something that you truly love, then, th- then you have to kind of take it all in. And I guess that goes back to even, the late night horseback rides. It's just kind of all of that to me is a, a new experience that like, yeah. I, you gotta, you gotta take in everything about the experience and not just, I mean, if you're 10 miles back in there and you got a herd bullet at 10 yards and you can't get a shot between the trees, like, yeah, you can get a little bit upset about it, but man, how many people are going to experience that? See, and that's, like, that's kind of like what I thought, you know, the I, w- I was up there in Colorado for a better part of two weeks, and the first week we had some sign. They just they weren't there. Um, I think we had missed them, and they had moved to private already. But then, you know, I was just I learned from that. I saw yeah. like okay, learned about different things, saw di- good sign, figured things out, and it was a learning experience for me. But then when we had that herd bull that came in, I'm not pissed that I didn't get a <laughs> shot at him at all like after that happened like yes the icing on the cake would have been putting an arrow through that bull and getting to walk up and hold his antlers but just the experience alone we were in elk every day the last week but just couldn't make it happen just bad shot opportunities didn't want to make bad shots stuff like that but just the fact that i had a herd bull (laughs) with 15 different cows right there in front of me i'm like dude i if I never elk hunted again, like this, <laughs> this was awesome. I wouldn't even pissed. It, yeah. See, I, I go back and forth on it. Cause yeah, I, I would get upset for a little bit, but at the same time I have to sit back and think yeah. like, man, like how, how crazy is it? I think last year I, I, um, I had a friend with me who had never been on like a backcountry elk hunt and, um, 
she was there for a couple of days and I called the bull into 10 feet God. and he, he was a big six. He was not a big six, but he was a good six point. And yeah. he walked around. He walked around this tree and saw me. And like, I drew back and I looked back at her because she had the rangefinder. I was like, "Should I shoot?" Like he's he's like ten feet away, and uh, like that was like a jaw dropping moment to her. Um, and for me, even like I hadn't been that close to an elk before, mm-hmm. not a live one, and. Did that I don't know. To me, that experience was probably better than actually shooting a bull on hunt. Um, although I had a crazy experience shooting a bull on hunt. Yeah. Um, but it, all of that stuff, and you know, the other thing too is a lot of I've seen it, and I've actually heard it a lot more now. Is the good and bad of social media? I guess is people go on hunts with other people, and then you get you get an elk coming in, and all of a sudden somebody jumps the line to to try and get their shot off or their opportunity. And, mm-hmm. and, and it, it, I don't know if it's uh, the whole me mentality or if it's like, I want to show this off to everybody or what it is. And, you know, like to me, if I'm going to take somebody, I, I want to see them shoot. It's more important for me to do that. And I mean, I'll, we'll split up the meat regardless, but yeah. Um, it, it, trying to get rid of that. Like a lot of people have that selfish mentality where, they're like, oh, I, I'm going to take the shot, even though it's not, they're not in position and they blow it or something like that. And it's just kind of, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of things that goes on in the hunting world. And the hunting world tears apart, or the hunting industry tears itself apart more than anything I've ever seen. But yeah. Um, well, hell, I mean, I just posted a video on TikTok of me shooting my bow at TAC. It went viral. It's that like I don't even don't even ask me why. I I literally just started TikTok as much as I didn't want to. It's got almost two million views, and there's dudes. On, yeah, I, I have no idea. No music. There's literally nothing to it, and I've got guys on there. I mean, it cracks me up. I mean, it doesn't bother me one bit. But just what you're talking about, like the industry tearing itself up. There were guys on there that were hunters that were tearing me apart about how I was shooting. I shouldn't have taken that shot. Oh, you sailed it 20 <laughs> feet over his back. Oh, that didn't hit foam. And it's just like, shut the <laughs> hell up. You are part of the problem. They, it, there's a lot of little knickknack things there. And that's, yeah, that's one of them is the critiquing and everything. It's like, you know, if you're going to give advice, like do it for one, do it maybe privately and maybe say something like, have you thought about something like this or what was, is there like, why did you do those things? And like, there's a way to critique people that is, is uh, genuine and it's wholesome. Yeah. Um, but, but then, like I said, like I had that guy show up on my Instagram the one time before I shot that big bull and he's like, I don't understand why you have so many followers and everything. And, like is all you do you shoot all these like little bulls and i mean the guy had a decent six point on his profile picture but i mean who cares dude like a bull's a bull I, man i i mean a bull in the middle of the backcountry with a bow is and then you gotta haul it out of there like that's that's i mean i don't care if it's a spike or a cow i mean if you want to drag a cow out of there go for it um i'm not gonna do it yeah um, <laughs> but it's uh like that's an achievement and there's no reason to like tear somebody apart actually so i just posted and it was it was kind of and i i think the joke went over everybody's head but the cow that i just shot i posted about her not being the biggest broad on the mountain (laughs) i saw it so the whole reason behind it was because you know everybody shoots something and there's probably going to be a hundred guys listen to this podcast and they will think that they've done it but when they go shoot something and then they post a picture of it, the first words of that post are, well, he's not the biggest or something like that. I it's, hate like, that. it's like, who cares, man? Like you killed an and, animal. And, well, and so many people, so many people on that post, they comment, they're like, she looks big to me. And I'm like, guys, the joke just went way over your head. Yeah. I, I love you all, but it, uh, yeah, I was just doing it because you know, who cares? Like, I was happy with her. I was happy with the shot. That was the first time I had shot an elk with a rifle in like 12 or 13 years. It's yeah. crazy to me. Um, she didn't go far. I was like, well, I can still shoot a rifle apparently. And, and um, 
I had the horse there and it was just kind of a fun experience. My buddy actually came up and he brought his kids up to help us and they got Mm -hmm. to experience all of it, which was cool. Um, but there's no reason for it. Like be, be happy, be proud of, of what you shot. Like, cause especially elk, I mean, most people don't realize the, um, the harvest rate for archery elk hunting is like Mm. less than 10%. Yeah. For most, yeah. Most places. Yeah. It's it's less than ten percent of people actually take some of their bow, and so you know if you if you shoot a spike with a bow and he comes running in bugling like, man, you're one of the ten percent that year. Be proud of it. Yeah, and and there's no reason not to be. <laughs> and yeah. I I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions with elk hunting too is I've had people tell me like oh, you've been to Colorado now two or three times and you've gone elk hunting and you haven't killed one yet? Like, what the hell, man? You just suck at hunting? It's like, <laughs> why Why are you wasting your money on that? Like, go pick up a rifle. Go kill one that way. And it's like, okay, first off, let me see you go pick up a bow and then put anywhere between 40 and 60 pounds on your back and go hike yeah. in three to four miles and let me see you do that. Uh, well, and, and the, I, I don't think that... Um... <clears throat> the harvest rates with the rifle are much better. If, if not, they might be worse. Um, Heck, I'd have, I'd have to go look to I, tell you. Uh, yeah, I know it's not, I know it's not much better if that. And so, but yeah, I mean, that that's a tough animal um, to hunt regardless. And it has to do with the terrain and, and what's going on. And, and, but yeah, you, you do get a lot of people that are sit there and want to tell you like, what do you, like you can't shoot anything or what happened. Like if I come off the mountain and I don't have, I don't have an elk nowadays. Like people think it's like, is the world ending? Is something I'm wrong? Like, no. <laughs> no, it's, it's hard shit, man. Uh, um, it is. <laughs> it's freaking hard, man. It is. And, but that goes back to like, you have to enjoy the experience and it's not always about killing something. No. Um, I, and if you, it, it doesn't matter if you're a solo guy that's trying to like, I guess, broaden like your skills and everything else, or you're taking that horseback up for the first time, or if you're going in with buddies and you're just like enjoying the experience, like it's, there's, there's a lot to it. Um, you don't always have to shoot something, even though we, I mean, I know it would be nice. Um, yeah. <clears throat> have meat in the freezer is always a great thing. But, oh yeah. Especially now with the government trying to like, feed us fake beef or whatever yeah whatever, whatever that crap is <laughs> yeah it's no I, I, I there's just something about getting up there on the mountain and i mean did you did you play sports growing up high school and everything i did so i was a high school baseball football player i was supposed to go to college and play baseball but shoulder exploded so okay so yeah it was pretty bad so you understand then just kind of like you know growing up i think there's so much that's put on sports on young adults and teenagers and kids nowadays that, you know, it's the only way out. This is how you're going to be a millionaire. And kids put so yeah. much focus into it and all the time, energy, adrenaline, all of this into it. And then when they don't make it, you kind of have like this, um, I guess you could call it a sense of just failure and just missing out on so much. And so I was kind of like that growing up, went and did the whole college track thing. But then I can after that, didn't really have that sense of team or kind of like a overall bigger goal that I was trying to go after. And then when I found elk hunting, um, you kind of have that again, man. And it's to be able to go out there and try and achieve something tough like that and just get on their, on their playing level on their turf and then go into their home and try and kill them. It's completely different than like your typical going up in a tree stand, trying to kill whitetail. It's, it's a new form of, it's a different form of competition. Yeah. And if people don't want to call it a sport, they, they can. And people, there will probably be somebody out there that gets like really offended by me trying to say it's competitive or I'm, I'm competing with an animal and whatever. Uh, but that looks, I mean, there's a, there's a video out there, some meme of this guy. He's like up in a tree stand. He's like, he's like upset because he's like, everybody is talking about, how they don't have anything. He's like, have you ever like they got nose, their ears, and, and I don't know. He's just going off because he, he can't get a shot off, and like he keeps getting those will like blow at him, and the buck will pick him, and 
he's like all upset about it and you know that's what it is they, they have their competitive advantage and and we're trying to go in there as the underdog and take it that's why 10 percent of people knock one down yeah um and and so for me like i feel blessed to be able to learn as much as i can about the animal and and like my harvest rate is really pretty high um most of the time i come out with something but i also work in, extremely hard um and i i'm a public land guy too i'm not one of those guys that unfortunately the industry has gotten to the point where there's a lot of people that the, the animals that they kill they're all ranch they're all ranch hunts uh um, yeah or the their, their private land guy to walk you up to the animal kind of a hunt i, I want to do it myself and that's just me and that whole competitive streak in nature and just like you it's it's uh yeah and i i mean i'm a big baseball to me has always been my love and that's not necessarily the team i mean it's a team thing but at the same time it's an individual that ball is only for one guy at any given point in time and, yep. uh, two against and the ball a, yep pretty much and i'm a diehard astros fan so right now it's a little little stressful but uh you're an astros fan and you're up in idaho I'm a diehard Astros fan. I went to the World Series a couple of years ago. Like I, I'm already thinking about trying to get on a plane here in a week if it's if it happens. Um, I got some friends down there in Houston. So oh, okay. Yeah, if, uh, <clears throat> that that's that's an experience in itself in the World Series. Heck yeah. Um, <clears throat> but <clears throat> yeah, I don't I don't even know where actually. Yeah, that that was the whole growing up as a kid thing too. Is yeah, the Astros. Thing. Yeah, but well, man. Um, I c- I kind of want to. I kind of want to get us back on track with the uh, with Numa a little bit. I know we kind of went. All down, right. We went down some rabbit holes there, but uh, <laughs> let's talk recon team. You've been a part of the recon team now for about two years, I think, since we kind of had the original Terra pattern. So I kind of want to find out from you right. how you got involved with Numa and <clears throat> what does it mean to you to be a recon team member to kind of close this podcast off. You know, so I was actually one of like your first 50 to 100 customers ever. Oh, and this yeah. was long, be- long before you guys. Um, I I saw it, there was a social media ad. I remember it on Facebook even. And it didn't have anything except for the pattern. <clears throat> and to me, I was hunting in a lot of like brown terrain and, and rocks at the time. And so to me, it was like, you know, I really like that pattern. And I went and read about him and I ended up getting in contact with one of the guys that was one of the higher ups there. And he, he was telling me about the technology and the areas that they wanted to go towards and who they were targeting and kind of what they wanted to do as a company. And I, I, I really liked the fact that I could get a hold of like an owner at that time, even before they, they hadn't even like officially been able to send any products out yet. Yeah. And <clears throat> so that I waited, I had like a calendar mark or like a date marked on the calendar for when their official launch was. And I think I ordered the original, um, the original tenacity pants and I ordered in the, uh, actually I still have them on. I I literally have the original tenacity pants on right now. (laughs) But, uh, then the, the Marina wool and everything. And I, I ordered a few things and I got involved with the company back then. Um, I was working, I was doing the hunting fitness thing for another company that's not around, uh, called the I hunt fit back then. And, and, um, he, we, we got a whole bunch of people that were connected to the company involved. There was, a there, I think we had like 300 guys ordering Numa products back then. Shoot. And, um, yeah, dude, I'm, I've helped you guys grow long before you did. Heck yeah. um, and it, um, and I was always, I always loved to be able to like get on on the phone and, and talk to the people that were involved. And I think, I think even like Fred might've been involved back then. And I was messaging him once in a while. Um, and so I've got to see it evolve. I've got to see you, them come out with the original like base patterns and base product lines and how they wanted to change everything every year. And I remember getting on the phone with one of the guys and they would tell me, okay, this is what's coming out, but don't tell anybody. And this is what we're changing. And I would be able to put in my input a little bit here and there or what I liked. Yeah. And, and it was different than just writing a review on, online. And so that was kind of something that I took personal because I, there, 
I had dealt with other camos in the industry and stuff there was stuff that I didn't like and stuff that I did and yeah, but I wanted to be I don't know, I wanted to pick one company and one pattern and not I, I didn't want to look like a NASCAR driver out there in the middle of the wilderness with different gloves and different uh, I got a buddy who I call him like NASCAR for hunting pretty much because he'll wear like he'll wear key pants and a uh, sick top and and first light beanie and <laughs> real tree gloves and I'm like, oh dude, we gotta we gotta fix this. <laughs> um and so yeah, so it, that's kind of where it started and then I remember I called them one time and they're like, Well, we they're uh, Cody, you guys and, and you guys have, have take we're we're taking it into a new direction and and I got in touch with Cody and that was right before I want to say that was right before I killed this big six by seven. Um, but he was, he was telling me that, or, and it was nice because I was able to get in touch with an owner still. And I was able to, and you guys are growing tremendously. Yeah, uh, we were talking about how, how, how quick products were out and to be able to, I don't know, we've all, we all love to be part of the hunting industry, so to speak. Like, I don't want to do the, the sponsorship deal anymore, but anybody that's out there they, they want to get involved with these companies or they want to they reach out and i'm sure you guys get a hundred emails about sponsor me and oh, you should see you should see the social <laughs> media inbox sometimes uh, oh amy oh yeah you, you and amy you probably get tons of emails about that stuff. Uh, um i i get it i used to get it and i probably will when i have a new product line that's, that comes out and once it goes towards the hunting industry it's uh I'll get those emails again. It's always fun, but um, <clears throat> to be involved, like I, I don't, I don't know, to be able to, to gain like the personal friendships with companies that are growing and, and watching people grow and to be able to put in my input, especially like with the recon team and, and having, and making it such a, like a, a tight knit small community, like next year, I want to be able to go to multiple more like TAC events. So that way I can get in touch with like, I think it's Brad or Brad Allen or something. Um, and then there's a couple others. I've never met Fred. I'd love to go and, and meet Fred. Fred's pretty cool, man. I've, Him and uh, he, Yeah. And so I'd like, I'd like to go spend some time with these guys and, and making such like a tight, small knit community where we're able to, we reach back out. Um, and talk to each other regularly on, on social media and, and having to be able to like give some input on what we see as far as like the product line, if there's any issues. And I think you guys are going, you're doing <clears throat> some good things with some of the changes that were made. Uh, the, the pursuit pants, I love them. Um, they actually work really well. That was the first pair of pants that you guys could, uh, convince me not to wear the tenacity pants so that's a good one <laughs> dude that pants um, sold out quick in popular sizes did it? yes i'm not surprised i was actually i didn't think it was going to make it here for my hunt and i ended up i've worn it most of the time it's it's warm um for even on like the colder days they get a little heavy when they get wet but other than so, so does everything at that point yeah um and so but yeah it's to be able to go to the events and, and um kind of display what what the company is doing and and be involved in the growth standpoint is is something I, I i don't take it lightly i know sometimes i don't always get the feedback back to you guys as as much as i would like to and it's just that's just my own life being kind of crazy and <clears throat> so forth i need to do better at it but it's uh it's been fun especially as you guys have as i've watched it grow and shoot i don't you're probably 10 times the size of what it was when i first got involved five years ago um since i got involved a year ago it's um the growth i've seen it's just like dang it's taken off man well the tack events are really cool and so if you guys are going to do that next year i'm sure you will yes Um, yes that that was a blast to meet a bunch of people and also to to get the product out in front of people and watch them because a lot of people hadn't seen it and so it that was cool to actually witness and and now especially on social media like i see so many i'll just be scrolling through and i'll see it and i'm like oh hey like more people wearing new on a regular basis which is cool to see and, and hopefully there's a lot more stuff coming out and i get i get asked questions all the time like is this really worth it like so to be able to get my fair input 
like left and right and, and what I think is good and what I think is 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 fun. So it's <clears throat> and I'm not I'm not being too biased because some of that stuff I just won't use and some of those guys that come out here they won't use, but a whitetail hunter, man, it's all for them. Heck um, yeah. I think I sent some guy over to your website the other day to buy the, the brush or pants and like I can't really use them too much, but where he's at, man, they are like they are perfect. Yeah. So well and I think that I mean that's one of the goals we have with this company is like, yeah, sh- yes, we're a whitetail hunting company at our roots, but we're going to make an item or we're going to make gear that you can take just about anywhere. We're going to have something that you can take up in the whitetail stand. If not, we're going to have something that you could probably take out to Kodiak Island chasing after whatever up in Alaska. Yeah. So, I mean, we want to, the, the, the puffy coat is like, I've never had one of those like that big and, and warm, but, if I'm moving at all, I can't wear it. It's no, just, it's I can't either. I, it's like the perfect. It's the perfect jacket for glassing. Or, dude, I slept in that thing. Like I just, I slept in my pursuit pants, put that on, climbed into my sleeping bag in the tent, and dude, I never got cold. It was perfect. And it, I mean, when we woke up, there was frost everywhere. It was perfect. Yeah, it, that's. Well, I haven't slept there yet. I'm not that cold, but. It, I mean, it, I guess it was cold the other night, but I have everybody always asks me my opinion on sleeping bags, and this is just random off topic, but I have like a really old military, like minus 20 sleeping bag that weighs nothing. Really? And yeah, and it's like it, everybody comes out with these big zero degree sleeping bags, but they're like twice the size and twice as heavy. And they're, they're not freaking huge. As warm. They're not nearly as warm. And I have this like little tiny old military bag that, man, I like, I'll sweat to death if it's over 20. Um, so <laughs> that's always kind of nice, but yeah, the puffy, I was the puffy. I love that one. Um, and, and some of the, I know you guys got some new stuff coming out next year and that's always fun. Yeah. We've got some, yeah. just for those that are listening to, I mean, we've got some accessories that are coming out. We're going to drop some new lines. Uh, we're going to make some updates to some older items. Uh, I think that's about all I could share so far. Uh, but <laughs> what I can share is we're gonna have some more solid items, some kind of every, that, everyday lifestyle gear that's gonna be dropping later this fall and winter. That's the big trending thing right now is the the solids. Big time. Uh, I had a buddy that just he just shot a bull a few days ago. Uh, his goal was to go back with an old flannel, like a red flannel, and <laughs> take the pictures. No, to actually shoot and hunt in it. And did he- and he did. He, he dropped a bull with a big old with a red flannel and everything. But he was. I'll be damned. It's it, it's a little warm and everything for him. But just the idea, and that's why so many people now are going even to the solids. Is yeah. It, they just. It's not. Oh, maybe there's a camo that doesn't quite fit. But when you're in the, and so they'll they'll. It, I think you guys did well with the. It's not green. It's what you call it, beluga. Yeah, the beluga um, gray color. <laughs> that like I wear that just as much because it'll it blends in with the rocks or whatever mm-hmm. background that I have, and you don't necessarily have a, an off color and and tra- yeah, everybody. I mean, well, just like I said, I'm wearing the tenacity green pants right now. Um, the old, <laughs> and that's old kind of, school. That's, yeah, that's like my everyday attire half the time. Um, <laughs> that's is the old awesome. the, the original like the solid colors is is kind of. A lot more people are wearing them on a day-to-day basis. I think it's especially, it, it's more comfortable. I mean, let's be honest, like hunting, part of the reason that I buy all the camo that I do is just because it's, it's more comfortable than anything else I wear. So I might as well just wear it everywhere. Yeah, and then people so. want something that they can they can hunt in, something they can wear to dinner, and something they can wear to work. All three in exactly. one. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I think yeah. that's what, I think I wear that, that waypoint the waypoint vest that I wear everywhere. Same. So same. Well, brother, I really appreciate you hopping on the podcast. I know we usually in these things about an hour, but I love where this one went. We definitely went down some rabbit holes. I loved it, but man, I just want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to sit down with me for a little while today. Yeah. Thanks for having me, man. I know we've been trying to do this for a little while and hunting season and everything else gets in the way, but heck yeah. Thanks for, uh, finding a way to get this going and make we'll have to do it again like at a trade show or something oh absolutely man real quick have some fun with the video heck yeah tell the uh tell the listeners uh where they can find you on instagram or any other social platforms 
Oh man, I'm too old for most of these social things. Like, You're not I'm a not talker yet. I'm not gonna do the TikTok like you. So, <laughs> <laughs> come on, man. But uh, nope, not gonna do. It. I ain't got no time for that. But <laughs> I just learned how to make reels the other day. So, um, but you can find my Instagram primarily is what I do everything on, and that's Relentless Hunter. But it's H N T R at the end. Okay. Um, you can follow my little adventures on horseback and all the crazy stuff that I do. I think. I think that one reel that I just did from my September elk hunt has kind of gotten, I don't know, it's been viewed like 50,000 times or something like that, which is kind of fun. But, See? TikTok, <laughs> yeah, man. TikTok. No, bro. Not going to do that. <laughs> I, I actually tried it once and I was like, I don't understand this. And that's just, this is too much. <laughs> Social media is too much for me. I don't like the attention. But... <laughs> well, there you go. There you go, everybody. You can find Jeff over there on Instagram. Check him out. Go give him a follow. And uh, Jeff, we just appreciate you, man, hopping on. All right. Thanks for having me. I'll talk to you later, Will. There you go, everybody. Another end to another episode of the Geared for the Outdoors podcast. We just want to thank Jeff Moran for hopping on with us today, letting us pick his brain, get to know him a little bit more, and go down a couple of rabbit holes. Everybody, we want to wish y'all a happy Thanksgiving again. We can't thank all of y'all enough for the support that y'all have shown us throughout this year. 2022 is coming up, and it's going to be a big year for us. we got a lot of great plans for the upcoming year. We can't wait to show y'all all the stuff that we're going to be doing, the things that are going to be dropping, the product coming out. We can't wait to share all that with you guys. And again, we just want to thank you for your support and tuning in to the Gear for the Outdoors podcast. This is Will, and I'll see you all on the next one.